Chapter 2 Chemistry Review We need to review just enough chemistry to get through the A and P series. I'll cover pH, some basics of chemical reactions, and the four major types of molecules found in the human body. Many molecules have covalent bonds, meaning they share electrons. The covalent bonds in water are special in that the oxygen atom holds on to the electrons a little bit more tightly than the hydrogen atoms, making it polar. It has an end that is slightly negative and two sides that are slightly positive. The slight positives combine to the slight negatives of other water molecules. Sodium chloride is held together by an ionic bond. This bond is not very strong and can easily be replaced by hydrogen bonds. The crystals of sodium chloride thus dissolve when placed into water. We can't see the hydrogen bonds. They don't last for very long, but we can see their effects. It does provide a little bit of energy, these slight negative and positive interactions. And to break these bonds would require some energy. There are some insects who are not heavy enough to break hydrogen bonds, and therefore they float on the surface of water. So covalent bonds, or the sharing of electrons, are strong, whereas ionic bonds and hydrogen bonds are both weaker interactions. Next up, when we dissolved that salt into water, we made a solution. The salt was the solute. Electrolytes are solutes that carry a charge when dissolved in water. If water is the solvent or the liquid, we would call it an aqueous solution. In chemistry class, you may have used other types of solutions, but in the human body, this is the only type we will be discussing. So we can dissolve the solute into the solvent, creating a solution. At some point, the solvent cannot contain any more solutes, and they will begin to precipitate out of solution. So anything that does not dissolve is the precipitate. Next up, we need to talk a little bit about chemical reactions. We won't be balancing equations like you did in your chemistry classes, but we do need to understand some of the basics. We typically draw chemical reactions with an arrow. However, we need to keep in mind that many of these reactions are reversible. And frequently, many of these reactions do not occur spontaneously, but will require the help of a catalyst, such as an enzyme produced in the human body. A chemical reaction can reach equilibrium, meaning there is no net change. In this make-believe example, let's say that the blue spheres turn into red ones 50% of the time, and the red ones back into blue ones 20% of the time. We'll get this going. Blue ones will turn into red, and a few red back into blue, and we will get more and more red ones as time goes on. Eventually, we will reach equilibrium, where there is no net change in the number of red and blue spheres, even though there are still changes to the individual circles or spheres. That was an example of dynamic equilibrium. The solution was not changing, even though the individual molecules might still be changing. For instance, we may have a constant number of relationships between these little goobers, even though the relationships are changing over time. That's dynamic equilibrium, constant with change. Next up, in a solution of neutral water, there is dynamic equilibrium. Some of the water molecules are breaking apart into an H plus and an OH minus. This happens just temporarily. Water molecules will reform pretty quickly 
but even in neutral water there are a certain number of free-floating H plus and OH minus ions. The number is 10 to the minus 7 moles per liter, or you can say there is always an equal number of H plus and OH minus if the water is neutral. If I were to add more H pluses, this would be an acidic solution. There would be more H pluses than OH minuses. Conversely, if I had fewer H pluses, the solution would be alkaline. The pH would be higher than 7. So at pH 7, there's 10 to the minus 7th moles per liter of free H plus ions. To make something more acidic or more basic, we have more H plus or fewer H plus. Anything lower than pH 7 would be acidic. Anything higher than pH 7 would be alkaline. Acids, like hydrochloric acid, can donate protons or H plus to a solution, making it more acidic, whereas bases can accept H plus from the solution, making it more alkaline, or raising the pH. The pH scale is logarithmic, so every time the number in the pH changes by 1, the concentration of H plus has changed tenfold. The body contains a number of buffers to keep the pH from changing drastically. Buffers are molecules that can either donate or accept protons depending on their concentration in the solution. This imaginary buffer here could accept extra protons if they were created, thereby keeping the pH constant. On the other hand, it could donate protons, keeping the pH constant. So buffers can keep the pH constant by either accepting or donating those free protons. So let's review. Sodium chloride is what type of molecule? Hopefully you said as a salt, whereas sodium hydroxide is a base. Hydrochloric acid is of course an acid, and that last one is just another way of writing water. So those are some of the basic atoms that we will be discussing, as well as water molecules and pH. Next up, let's talk about organic compounds. Organic means they contain carbon atoms. Shown here are isomers. They have the same molecular formula, but different structures. Therefore, they will behave differently in the human body. Organic molecules can also form rings. The two shown here are molecules that you would not want to have inside of your body. Next up, when discussing organic molecules, we might discuss functional groups. The same functional group is shown here, an alcohol group. Functional groups tend to behave the same in different molecules. The five major types of functional groups that you should learn are the hydroxyl, carbonyl, carboxyl, amino, and phosphate groups. We will see a number of these things throughout the year. Next up, we should cover the four main types of organic molecules that we find in the human body. And those are proteins, sugars, lipids, and nucleic acids. First up, the sugars, or carbohydrates, I should say. Shown here are two simple sugars or monosaccharides. These are isomers, glucose and fructose. They have the same molecular formula, but different shapes and different properties within the human body. A simple sugar contains six carbon atoms and six oxygen atoms linked by covalent bonds, as well as 12 hydrogen atoms. Two of these covalent bonds can be rearranged to switch the sugar from the circular to its linearized form. 
Sugar molecules can be stored in large polymers, such as starch found in plants, or in humans we will be talking about glycogen this year. This is more stable and easier to store than sugar crystals. Plant cells also produce cellulose as part of their cell wall. This is something that human cells do not do. So those were the carbohydrates. Next up, let's talk about lipids. Lipids are a large family of molecules, including fatty acids, triglycerides, phospholipids, and cholesterol. They all tend to be hydrophobic, meaning they do not dissolve readily in water. Shown here are the molecular formula of lipids compared to hydrocarbons like gasoline. And you'll notice the only difference is this functional group here, the carboxylic acid. When we store lipids in the body, we typically store them as a triglyceride, which includes three long fatty acids, all attached to a single molecule of glycerol. This is the molecule that we typically refer to as fat, although it is more accurate to say triglyceride. So a triglyceride is one glycerol, covalently linked to three fatty acid molecules. Notice that we have the same atoms found in glucose, so we can readily convert this triglyceride into a molecule that we can use for energy. Out of our fatty acids, they may be saturated or unsaturated. Unsaturated fatty acids have at least one carbon-carbon double bond, whereas saturated fatty acids do not. Some of the unsaturated fatty acids may be liquid at body temperature, and we would call them oils. A saturated fatty acid has only carbon-carbon single bonds. But if some of those hydrogens were removed and we formed a carbon-carbon double bond, this would now be an unsaturated fatty acid. You may even discuss polyunsaturated fatty acids, which have multiple carbon-carbon double bonds. Those carbon-carbon double bonds come in two flavors. They can be in the cis conformation, meaning the hydrogen atoms are on the same side of the carbon-carbon double bond, or they can be in the trans conformation. The hydrogen atoms are on opposite sides of the carbon-carbon double bond. These molecules may be isomers, meaning they have the same number of atoms, but they are arranged differently, and this can lead to very different properties in the human body. Trans fats have a much higher melting temperature and tend to remain solid in the body, which can lead to plaques forming in the arteries, which can lead to heart disease. The cis fats, on the other hand, tend to remain liquid, and so do not contribute to heart disease. I'll change. So our three basic types of fats that we need to worry about are the trans fats, that tend to remain solid at body temperature and are definitely unhealthy, the cis fats, which have this kink in them, which makes them not pack together as tightly, hence they are less solid or more liquid at body temperature. These tend to be more healthy. Lastly are the saturated fats, which do not have carbon-carbon double bonds. And while these two tend to remain solid, they are definitely not the same as the trans fats. In fact, we can say that saturated fats are neither healthy nor unhealthy. This came from studies back beginning in the 70s. It was noticed that Eskimos, who thrived off of a high-fat diet, did not get the same amount of heart disease as Americans or British. At the time, it was thought that a high-fat diet was unhealthy, so this was difficult to explain, and led to the hypothesis that maybe not all fat was bad. There could be good fats and bad It was initially hypothesized that the difference between healthy and unhealthy would be the difference between saturated and unsaturated. However, we now know that trans fats, which are unsaturated, 
are definitely unhealthy. Other unsaturated fats, the ones that I called cis fats, are definitely healthy for the human body. These sometimes get names like the omega-3 fatty acids. They are healthy because they do not form plaques in the arteries and can even sometimes dissolve plaques that are there, which reduces the risk of heart disease and other diseases associated with restricted blood flow. The best evidence that we have today are that the cis fats, like the omega-3 fatty acids, are definitely good for us. And the more of these that we eat, the healthier we will be. Trans fats, a different type of unsaturated fatty acid, are definitely bad due to the fact that they form plaques in our arteries. On the other hand, there is no evidence for or against saturated fats. They don't seem to be good for us, but they also don't seem to be bad for us. Fatty acids are hydrophobic, meaning they do not form hydrogen bonds, and therefore do not dissolve well in an aqueous solution. Hydrophilic molecules, on the other hand, do dissolve readily. So fatty acids here, because of their long hydrocarbon tails, cannot make hydrogen bonds with water. To maximize the number of hydrogen bonds between water molecules, fat molecules will tend to stick to one another instead of dissolving in the solution. There are other lipids besides fat or fatty acids and triglycerides. One very important one are the phospholipids. These are special in that they have a hydrophilic head group, and two hydrophobic fatty acid tails. For that reason, they can readily form lipid bilayers, which are an integral part of the plasma membrane of cells. If we dump a bunch of phospholipids into water, they will form one of these structures, either a micelle or this bilayer, a double layer of phospholipids. Steroids are another type of lipid. They are synthesized from cholesterol. Being a lipid, they do not readily dissolve in water. The term steroids often gets used to mean performance-enhancing drug. Technically, an anabolic steroid includes testosterone or other molecules that mimic testosterone, whereas other performance-enhancing drugs like erythropoietin or growth hormone, are not steroids because they are not cholesterol derivatives. So those are the lipids and their basic chemistry. The next two are proteins and nucleic acids. Proteins are polymers of amino acids. There are 20 amino acids that get used in the human body. Others exist but we only use these 20. Every amino acid has an amino group and an acid group, that carboxyl group, a central carbon atom with a hydrogen on one side and something else on the fourth bond, that fourth thing we call the R group or a functional group. Different amino acids have different functional groups. A polymer of amino acids will fold into a unique three-dimensional shape based on the interactions between these R groups. Hydrophilic R groups like to bind to other hydrophilic groups. Hydrophobic ones like to stick to other hydrophobic ones. Acids like to stick to bases, etc. Part of the protein is the backbone with the R groups off to the sides. The backbone, guided by the R groups, will fold into this unique three-dimensional shape. This three-dimensional shape should have all the hydrophilic residues mostly on the outside and the hydrophobic ones mostly on the inside. This three-dimensional shape should also create a small pocket 
or an active site. Enzymes have an active site that can help to catalyze a chemical reaction. If a protein becomes denatured, the active site will no longer have the correct shape and this protein will not function properly. At the correct pH and temperature, a protein should be folded up properly, but changing the temperature or changing the pH could mess with the shape of the protein, making the active site no longer fit the substrate, for instance. Changes in pH can interfere with some of these weak interactions between R groups. Those were some of the quick basics about proteins. <clears throat> Lastly are the nucleic acids, which include DNA and RNA. DNA forms a double helix. A pair of sugar phosphate backbones are linked to one another by nitrogenous base pairs. This then twists into the helix shape. A's always pair with T's and the G's always pair with C's. When a cell divides, it must first duplicate its DNA in a process called replication. The DNA is unzipped and separated and new pairs are added. This is called semi-conservative DNA replication. I now have two double-stranded helices, each with an old strand and a new strand. This is carried out by an enzyme called DNA polymerase. After the DNA is unzipped, DNA polymerase helps to create new bonds between nucleic acids, pairing up A's with T's and G's with C's until I have two complete double helices each with an old strand and each with a new strand. The cell could then divide, make a copy of itself that is genetically identical to the precursor cell. In transcription, we don't copy the DNA, we transcribe it into an RNA copy. And to do this, I only use one of the two strands found in the double helix. This is carried out by an enzyme called RNA polymerase. It'll make a message copy called mRNA, which can leave the nucleus and enter the cytoplasm. RNA is similar to DNA, except that it does not form a double helix. It has a different sugar molecule, and instead of T's, it has uracil. Otherwise, these are both nucleic acids. The mRNA, once it leaves the nucleus and enters the cytoplasm, can be acted on by ribosomes, which will translate that message RNA into a polypeptide chain or a protein. mRNAs often contain sections that can be spliced together differently meaning we can make different versions of the same protein from the same mRNA. This is called alternative splicing. For instance, we might find one version of an enzyme in the eye and a different one in the vasculature. Certain drugs might prefer to bind to one of these enzymes rather than the other. Higher levels of the drug, though, might begin binding to the first splice variant causing side effects. This is why it's important to keep the dosage proper when using medications. Because of alternative splicing, we have about 30,000 genes, but we can make those 30,000 instructions slightly differently into about 100,000 or so different proteins. So those are some of the basics about nucleic acids and DNA and RNA.